Okay, here we are live now. I'm just telling Rose, come back in the studio. Okay, here she comes. <laughs> Shalom. Good evening. I'm so sorry. Here's our guest. Here's Rose. Rose, don't leave me here alone. Here we go. <laughs> We're here. Oh, wow. That was stressful. That was like, um, you know, that's stress. That's TMS. I could have a rash right now. I could start itching. I could be feeling nauseous. I could have a headache, but I was like, or stomach ache. It's okay. <laughs> Everything's okay. I'm, you know, Same. handling this. I'm embarrassed, but I'm accepting that I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I'm feeling the responsibility of on my shoulders and we are okay. This is TMS Roundtable Global. I am Dr. Tova Goldfine. It is Monday night in Israel. It is Tuesday morning in Australia, and it is New York time, four o'clock. You've changed your clock, so I was a little bit confused about that, and I appreciate your patience. Rose, I'm always happy to spend Monday nights, Tuesday mornings with you. Can you introduce our guest? Oh, good morning, Tova. Good morning, world. <laughs> Today we've got Karen Smith. Now, Karen, we're so blessed to have Karen because we we often have experts in the field. We often have people who are coaches or have other reasons for being on with us. But here we've got Karen who actually is sharing her story, her journey. Now, this journey may not be yours, but she's got the courage to actually talk about her journey and remember that we don't always get well immediately and there are other other factors involved you know us we humans have got a multitude of of systems within us and some of those systems are are hard to move and others are easy to move and karen we have a lovely story of she being moved very strongly in the beginning and then she almost dug her heels in and decided that she needed to still have a little bit of suffering <laughs> and until she watched Michael Galinsky's All the Rage movie. And by the way, Tova, can you put that on the link too for us so that anyone who's viewing this can actually go to that link and pick up Michael's movie. And Karen, thank you so, so much for being with us. Now, look, first of all, just give us just a general background of, of your type of personality. And by the way, folks, this is the book that, uh, she was familiar with yeah and if you haven't read it and you have somatic pain or you have symptoms that the doctors can't actually diagnose or that you're giving a diagnosis given a diagnosis should i say of something that doesn't that sounds out of this world read this book it's so worthwhile yeah. and as i picked it off the shelf this morning i noticed look look how old looking it is so it's been on my shelf for a long time and shared with a lot of people so here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and you, if I'm going off on a tangent, feel free to interject. <laughs> no, you're guys. welcome. You're it's welcome. Because that's I, how a journey is. I was just going to say, it's like my journey up and down and round. So yeah. um, prior to hearing about Dr. Sarno, I had been in my therapy session and I was dealing with new childhood trauma and secrets that I never knew. And I had bad back for about three years, just out of the blue no particular reason. And after I said to my therapist, I think all this rage is lodged in my back. And those were the exact words. And we were dealing with, well, I'll talk about it at some point, but um, two days later, I think it was, someone told me about Dr. Sarno and his theory. And in my mind, it was just, of course, there was no brainer to me. I was about 31 at the time. And when I went, I spoke to him on the phone. I went to him. He's exactly how everyone described. Short man with the bushy eyebrows and the white coat. Very, um, you know, I'm a New Yorker and I'm pretty direct myself. He was gruff, but there was something very nurturing and he was so confident. And I told him about my story and he said, you are a typical TMS patient. I didn't really know what that meant at the time. Um, and he was just so confident. My back aches went away very soon after his second lecture, like immediately. 
it made complete sense to me. He had the two lectures. And then soon after I started with all, I remember TMJ was the first um, uh, uh, imperative they talk about. And he would say what he would say, the pain would go away until the next and the next and the next. And he would, and every time I'd call him, he would say, it's on the run. And things that I hear now that, you know, I didn't really make sense, but it, but every time the pain would go away, I went to a group therapy with Dr. Arlene Feinblatt for a period of time. And I remember she intimidated me and I wanted to please her. And I remember thinking in the group, I'm not one of them. <laughs> and and yet I was and the pains went away and over the years you know I mean I can give lots of examples I'll get to because it's fascinating to me and I then um was getting moving in with my now husband and my allergies were out of control and he said he wanted me to go to a TMS therapist I had been in therapy with other great therapists, but not for these constant pains that would come up. And I started going to Dr. Kirsten Fliegler in Manhattan for nine years, and she helped a lot. My allergies went away, but you know, everything would keep coming back. And um, then I had very bad hip pain. Dr. Sarna was adamant that I didn't need surgery. There were never x-rays done. Then I it was three years. I mean, I couldn't walk. I was 51 at the time and it was horrible. And I went to Dr. Rauschbaum and begged him to give me x-rays. He took over Sarno's practice. And uh, the next day he called and he said, you have severe arthrosis. Um, you may or may not need a hip replacement. And at that point, he wasn't sure. And I just had the hip replacement and I have no regrets even though I had some complications, I fell three years later. Now, the three years from the hip replacement till I fell, it was the first time that I had no symptoms for three years of anything. Now, sorry to be all, all over the place. When I was 17, really the headaches were the worst. And they only went away when I watched the movie All the Rage and I found Nicole Sachs and Dan Buglia and Eddie Lindstein's podcast, which were really two years ago, actually, December. You were talking about symptoms getting better, symptoms getting better, but you always found a TMS solution. Yes. But you're going to yeah. talk about why they kept coming back, these yeah. symptoms. Well, so, um, yeah, well, one of the funny ones, I just have to get this one in. I remember <laughs> a podiatrist told me if I didn't have toe surgery for my rigiditis, whatever the hell he said, um, I wouldn't be able to walk in 10 years. Meanwhile, that's 20 years ago. And I called Sarno and he said, hogwash, put your heels back on. <laughs> and the toe pain went away. And that was 20 years ago. But I'm remembering incidents, emotional things that were going on in my life. And this was the piece that was missing. So for instance, with the toe pain, it was the first time I had to commute. I never lived with anyone. I moved in with my husband and it was stressful. Or when I went to Kirsten with the allergies, I was getting married, you know, that, and Dr. Sarno said to me, good events cause stress. And none of these things really made sense to me. Yeah. I felt like I was having PTSD from everything, not to mention childhood trauma, teenage trauma. So once I found Nicole and all of you guys, my like my heroes, really, what's different for me was there's a way in which you communicate this information that just clicked all of it. And I would speak about Sarno back, you know, in my 30s and 40s, trying to convince myself and everyone. I was so emphatic about it <laughs> and angry. Now I talk about it obsessively. It's all I could talk. But it's um, with fascination. My body is my own science experiment. Wow. And Jeez. I don't, the difference that I have with, you know, because of Nicole, Dr. Uh, Dan Buglia, is that A, I don't freak out anymore. 
Um, and it's, um, I learned to self-soothe. I never did. I felt I had to be perfect. Back to when I was with Arlene Feinblatt's group, it felt maybe embarrassing for me to be, quote unquote, one of them. I like the way you put that. You know, would you just talk about fear? Because the fear of the pain is the biggest, biggest problem. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about it, that fear is generated somewhere deep inside. It's right. not really about the pain. It's it's like the fear has come up like a volcano or something, and, and that's the overriding factor, yeah. isn't it, in all yeah. of this? Yeah. So just to get to a little of my childhood, so my mother, uh, my real mother, my birth mother committed suicide when I was two. And I was told things, I never knew how she died. And then um, when I was 17, right after um, my best friend in childhood had a severe head injury. And I went to see her in the hospital and she whipped off her head scarf. And I mean, it was, you know, a scary sight. And she said, will you still love me? And then when I was 19, I was with my mom who adopted me when she woke up paralyzed and the scream that I heard. So I was always scared my, until two years ago. I mean, I was so freaked out that something would happen because things did happen. And only in the last couple of months did I remember that the first headache I had was soon after my best friend's head injury. So I was so scared of the headaches and every pain. And now I don't have fear and it goes away. Yeah. So I flew back from um, vacation on Saturday night and the flight was horrible and I was petrified. Yesterday I had such a massive headache. I think it was the from the from the fear. And so once I soothe myself, I'm not scared and then the symptoms dissipate. Or, yes. or, or another another thing that I imagine because you you you've had so many years of pain is that you understand the message of the pain you didn't i mean how could you meet you know you meet your mo your mother with ms and your friend and how could you not have health anxiety and hate these symptoms you're you're not hating them you're almost saying give what is the message for, for oh, me wow oh wow that's a good one it's wow that's profound and yeah i mean I was wired. One of my therapists once said, it's your DNA. It's you're like wired to freak out and not freaking out is so in and of itself soothing. So I can turn down the dial. And then once COVID happened and quarantine, I did such a deep dive into all of this, listening to the podcast, but not just listening, doing the work as you, we all talked about, that I I wasn't doing the work. I mean, for instance, I used to journal. And when I found Nicole, I would reread my old journals 40 years worth, and it creeped me out, and I threw them away. So now I journal with a different intention, all the things that she advises, and it does. It feels like I'm releasing from my body. Wow. Yeah. Could you give us an example of of how she, just so that any people that are new to this can get the idea, of, because there's journaling and there's journaling. Yes. And until we actually journal with work, how does that sound? You're, like, yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I it's a work. Yeah. yeah, well, the difference prior to finding Nicole with my journaling, I was just repeating the facts. I yes. wasn't... Um, you know, the good, and the story was always the same, but once I found Nicole, it was like raging on the page right. and, you know, I'm a big cursor and the F you and all of that, but getting it out good with point. a different intention and I don't reread them, I rip them up. Um, I always, everyone I know relates to this. I hate doing it and I don't know why I would hate doing it. it you know, it's good for you. It's and cathartic. I, yeah. Yes. The ripping up is cathartic. Yes, yes, literally. Sometimes I verbally do it. Um, but I think that just writing your 
stuff down is is you're reporting. You're not like now I'm feeling it. Yeah. Um, and I don't do it that often. Yeah. Yeah. In ISTDP, what we do is we do a portrayal. When enough um, distress comes up and enough anger comes up, we do a portrayal. So the the journaling is sort of like a, a portrayal light. Right. So it, it's one of those things that actually breaks through into the unconscious. And then when the unconscious is opened, we can make the links. And it's right. just so lovely when a link is made and a person oh. sees, you know, like, for example, you know, um, your, your early childhood trauma. Like, to all intents and purposes, you know, you had a loving mother anyway. But those first two years would have been so frightening that your vasovagal system would be on full alert. And how Before do you switch I, it yeah. off? Yeah. Before I came to this planet, you know, when I was in her womb, I heard stories of what she went through. And yeah. I craved, so this is interesting also, um, I craved, I mean, we all, uh, safety, like it hurts. I want to feel safe. Money represents safety. Finding a husband for me represented safety, everything so deeply. And once I realized to reassure myself and not have to look for it all the time, you know, that helped turn my dial of my nervous system down. Um, yeah. And I can make myself feel safe. And then when the headache or, you know, that again, that was the scariest symptom or the one that was 43 years. I mean, now I don't get headaches. It's amazing. Right. It is, isn't it? And, and, and I was talking to, I, 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 you know, I really, I've been listening a lot to, to David Hanscom's work and he had James Pennybaker on his podcast, who's the big expressive writer guy. Listen. And I heard him say again that, you know, we, we have this neural pathway from childhood and that's not going away. And that's our default and go to. And all we can do is build another one till that other one, he says, um, starts to just not disintegrate, but it no it longer does. Yes. disintegrate. The, the, the neurons separate yeah. out. So we have the other with, one. Right. Yeah. With, with journaling. Yeah. With journaling and is it's such an important and it's hard. It's hard to do. It's not easy to do, but it doesn't mean you know, it's not, it's it, it's so freeing and it can be it can it can be I think the 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 fact that it's hard is a message for us. Exactly. That's mean something and because it can't it's safe. And what I learned from all of, you know, I call you all my heroes you know, Dan Buglia, what I learned is for me, one of the things that makes me feel safe is doing it anyway. One of the, er in the early, the, again, February, I think this was, um, I found all of you guys in December, 2019, and I was at work, I had a massive headache, and I put Dan Buglia on, I was gonna leave, I was gonna take a cab home from Manhattan to Long Island, and he was talking about take the walk anyway, and it was, damp and nasty in New York. It was February. And I walked 20 minutes to my train and the headache went away. And that was the first time. I mean, and then one more because it's, it's fascinating. It's kind of like, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's like yeah. Howard Stern saying in the movie, right. I, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to underestimate anyone's pain, but he's like, I, I began laughing at the pain because it was like, right. it wasn't there to hurt me. Yeah. One of my friends told me before my hip uh, surgery, she said, I think your hip pain is your best friend in a way. It was like now the pain that had been lodged in my back in the beginning now was lodged in my hip. And once I woke up from the hip surgery, it was the first time because I really had so much anger for my birth mother and feeling abandoned so deeply and a hole in my heart. I woke up at 51 from surgery and it was the first time I had compassion for this poor woman who was in so much pain. Yes. And grateful my mother who adopted me wanted to. So I felt like the pain obviously is messages to all of us. And I didn't realize that ever. Mm. Uh, could I just put an ad in here? Um, Karen Neaton, 
another ITD psychotherapist who is actually a recovery room nurse has realized that the anesthetic actually takes away some of the defenses and people often get a sort of an epiphany post anesthetic and the theory wow. the theory is that actually if you've got the right input at that time you can clear up a whole lot of old stuff but you've got to have the input you can't just have the anesthetic yeah. without having the catalyst to sort of open you up but you're open oh. up and available so just to okay. share that yeah. Yeah. yeah and that was the first thought i had when i woke up and uh, so i fell three years after the hip replacement and i dislocated my hip so then the next you know i was it was traumatized obviously and it dislocated a second time so i had a second surgery and wow. right before the second surgery the surgeon came over to me i was totally loopy from the med medicine and he said do you he said do you have back pain i said not in 30 years and his eyes widened in disbelief he said I can't believe that. I said, yeah, I went to Dr. Sarno and a lot of surgeons are, you know, they poo poo it. And he said, do you want to see your x-rays? I said, no, don't show me that. Like I knew enough to say, don't show me that. And he showed my husband, my husband said it was twisty. Like, and I knock wood, I don't have back pain. So, go That's right. so you're talking your story also, and uh, I will answer your question, Susie, in a minute. Your story is again, we're not against the medical system, you know, Rose and I and us TMS right. people, we are integrating, integrating. Right. And you're showing us how getting surgery, saved by Sarno, healing fibromyalgia, which you haven't even mentioned, you know, I and know understanding that. the, the and, and this may be your journey. You're on a journey for right. the rest of your life because you've had health anxiety and now you're understanding it on the big picture. Right. Well, and the other healing thing for me, you asked before and why the last two years have been helpful. There's a community. I felt alone. Yeah. None of yeah. my friends, you look know, at Susie. Okay. Yeah. look at Susie. Can you read Susie's yes. question? Can you read that? Can you see that, uh, Karen? I have a second there. How much? Of the Just what you're of saying. Yeah, exactly. And so I have a community. I'm not alone. It's it, so interesting. Again, no surprise. When I first found Nicole, again, it was on a really bad day on a Saturday. I would get my headaches on the only day I had with my husband. I cherished those days because of our work schedules. And my father had just passed away. And it was, I was like, I can't believe I can't even spend the day with him. I was in bed. So I was reading Nicole's, the, her Facebook page. And I remember I was in so much pain and I was crying so deeply and I threw up, but it didn't freak me out. I knew in that moment that this was the key. And because I found a loving community and I wasn't alone, my husband wasn't always so understanding of it. So that was another healing huge for me. Yeah. And as we know, you know, we, as we know, the, you know, there's always the, the balance, the community, you can get sucked into it and be like, why me? Why am I the victim? Why did I get better from reading Sarno? I mean, you're, you're on a journey for how many years? For 30. 30 years. So yeah. it has to be understood and taken in perspective and and i think that it's it's personal and i know susie you know susie has has you know various things that come up and, and i know a lot of um working with somebody now who's got better like you get better and then and then you're like why why it must be physical and then we're recreating the monster and it, it is a journey and you didn't see this is what i wanted to say you <laughs> are saying the word before you're 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 not only loving the pain, you're seeing the message and you're saying, this is my journey. I will fall again. Something will happen again. I am safe. I can, under right. and you're not, because people, they, what's that called? Independence outcome. If they have this outcome dependence, mm -hmm. I got to get better. It's got to be gone. I can't have any symptoms. Exactly. You, you're talk about that a little bit. And Rose, can you have a yeah. in your work? 
I used to tell my therapist, I want to just go six months without feeling some pain. And now, no, I'm going to go forever. However, of course, I'm going to have a headache or a something one day again, but it doesn't scare me. Yeah. Perfectionism is the right. problem, isn't it? Yes. Having to have it right. And if you think about it, that perfectionism actually comes from our earlier time where, where if we made a mistake, we're going to actually um, berate ourselves for making that mistake because oh, yeah. we won't be seen in a good light by our yeah. caregivers. It's so fascinating that we right. want to do the right thing all the time and then when we don't do it, it's not just an ordinary mistake or not something that we just forgot. It's more about berating ourselves for having done it as if we've right. got to be absolutely perfect. And we're and, the and only ones. We can forgive yeah. other people but we can't forgive ourselves. It's very, it's right. fascinating, really. And I didn't want to be like my birth mother, who I don't, you know, the crazy word. And I fought so hard to be at peace. But the fighting for the peace, it was a conflict. The and to me, you know, I know even for my own business or the way in which I met my husband, the minute I surrender, is when it happens wow. all the time. I mean, I, this to me. And that doesn't mean you're weak. Right, right. I remember in my 20s and 30s, I wanted to have a marriage-like relationship. And, you know, my mother uh, was devastated that her daughter wasn't married. And she'd call me, did you find a fella? Did you find a fella? And I remember... <laughs> I was going to be 40 and I was like, oh my God, like, you know, and it, it would hurt, it hurt me, of course, literally. And I remember saying to my mother, she called me and she said all the things that I would think a daughter wants to hear. And I felt so reassured. And I literally looked up at the ceiling. I said, she's going to die any minute now, but she's going to hook me up with the one and she's going to do it. And she died the next day or very soon after. And then I met my husband about a year or two after that. And it turns out his mother and my mother grew up together. So I, wow. think, but I surrendered was the point. Yeah. And so for the pains, when I surrender, I went on a bike ride a couple of, about a year ago. And it was the first time I had ridden a bike. I was so scared because of what if I fall and whatever. And I had such a bad headache on the way to the bike ride and I was going to cancel every second. My husband was talking and I was like, shut up. I can't, you know, and I kept saying, you'll be okay. And I did the words that Nicole, you know, you're safe and talk to myself as a little baby. The minute I got on the bike, I was fine. And I hadn't ridden in nine years. I rode for two and a half hours up hills. I was fine. So I, when I surrender, that helps me. Yeah. Well, isn't that the key to it? Yeah. Surrender yeah. to the feeling. Yes. 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 And yeah. knowing that it's not going to hurt you. Like, right. you know, sometimes patients think that um, that this pain that they've got is, is is a killer, I suppose, whereas in actual fact, if you were dying, you wouldn't be like that. Right. Do you know what? You know what I mean? Like yes. dying isn't yep. a, a bad thing and it, and it's not a difficult thing if you're at peace with it. But right. people right. who are in pain often think that it's, it's going to kill them right. and yet it's the last thing it's going to do, but it's going to make them agitated. Yeah. yeah. It's our relationship to pain. It used to be the most horrible thing in the world. Yes. And, you know, all of us, I mean, have survived a lot of pretty bad days. Yes. Well, you know, Karen, in a way, what you survived in your childhood was more painful right. than any of your somatic pain, wasn't it? And, yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. you know, our somatic pain is just a reflection of our heartache pain. And it, wow. it's the most important thing to actually realise that this physical pain, this back pain, this hip pain, this foot pain, is all about our heartache. And, right. Yeah. Exactly. And and I just you know now that's why I've, I I want to be on all these podcasts. I want people to feel hopeful. 
you know, I'm a headhunter in my business and I crave myself to feel safe so deeply. I want everyone to feel safe and reassured so much so that it hurts me. So I want to just tell the world, you know, so when people are looking for a job, I want, if they feel safe, they'll do better on their interviews. And if this community, the people that are still suffering feel safe, the pain will ease and then they'll build their own. Hey, but Karen, it's not so easy. I'm doing the devil's advocate. How do you feel safe? Right. Right. I didn't intend. How? How? So me? Um, so again, early on when I be, when I found everyone, I would say to my sister, I just want to hang out with these TMS people. They're so nurturing. You're all like the mommies that I wanted. You know, <laughs> even the, the male, you know, Dr. Dan Ratner, I listen to his every Monday night. He's like a daddy or a mommy. <laughs> And that makes me feel safe. I was the youngest of three. And so I was that typical, I wanted to feel safe. So for me, you all make me feel safe. But at and times it didn't. At times you were, you did. I didn't have you all though, until two years ago, until that's why I don't think I healed because I had my, I used to say to my therapist, what are we going to do when Dr. Sarno dies? You know, but I had her. But I feel like you've all helped me in a way that find the I doctor in you to find the doctor right. therapist exactly. in you. Right. Yeah. Well, so tell but us talk about talk about when you saw the movie because you you only you only um, saw the movie two years ago. Yeah. So, it was December. It was it, December. It was Christmas break, uh, 2019, and I was having a bad you know headache spout. Um, and my husband who, you know, sick of hearing me talking about this. Um, yeah, I made him watch it. Meanwhile, he was fascinated and it was on a Saturday night, you know, just a nasty December night. And I felt like crap and I watched it. And then I just researched all the doctors and therapists in the movie and just obsessively listened to their podcasts or reading their posts and one led to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Would you, Karen, expose a little bit more about the idea, you know, you were saying about getting the um, uh, allergies when you were going to get married. Can you, you know, like when good things come, sometimes yes. patients yes. find that so distressing because we go to that idea that pain is going to be a reflection of bad things. But in actual fact, pain is a reflection of many, many feelings. So you know, that feeling of being secure in a relationship, but when is it going to go bad or when is it going to go sour? Exactly. Can you talk about that a little bit, please? Yeah. Well, one thing, backtrack a second, when I would tell Dr. Sarno that every time I had a headache, it was upon waking up always from the very first one to this day. And he said the subconscious is very close in the morning. And the allergies. Well, that again, that's very important. The subconscious, we're close to the subconscious in the morning. So there could be more discomfort symptoms right. in the morning. It was always upon waking. So the allergies were also always upon waking. Uh, and then they would take over the day. So my therapist did teach me. She didn't talk about rewiring the brain or that wording, but she did it without those words, if that makes sense. So I equated it to having, I hated commuting so much because I never used to commute. I would walk four blocks and now all of a sudden I was living an hour and a half train ride and I dreaded it and the allergies were horrible in the morning. So I like, I don't know what I talked to myself that, you know, I'm not going to have these in the morning and just went away. And because you're so confident about it, it was yeah. also you, you, this whole community and Dr. Sarna, there's a confidence. Mm -hmm. And now I have it for myself. Well, I'd like to say to, to the audience, to the listeners, and I don't know if Sarna talked about this, but we know now in the field that, it, that the pain is, is information about you. This is a story. This is an opening up or what I call like, uh, a love affair with yourself and and you know I had I had a I had a client who was getting better and he went and told his friends how much better he felt and that night everything came back yeah. and I'm, I was saying to him well 
obviously you you had this ego and this joy and then you felt completely like oh like like completely um rejected and slapped in the face as opposed to knowing that you have an ego you have a sense of self you wanted you felt proud and then your unconscious as you were coming home from the party was like oh my god what if it comes back so I, I was saying this is a this is how you get to know or what Rose will call scaffolding, knowing yourself. And it's sad because how could he not feel terrible right, that his body right. was against him? So right. how, how can we tell share with people this is the the symptoms are about or talking to you about yourself? And before I met this group, I felt that my body was betraying me. And those were the words. I mean, I was in my late 40s. I had always been athletic. I couldn't walk. All my friends, my husband, they would make fun of me. They'd be like, what's with the waddle? And I really had this severe limp. And it was really bad. And it was embarrassing. And then in this community, hearing other people say they felt their body was betraying them. Now I know it's not. What's betraying you? Tell us what is betraying you. Oh, huh. <laughs> yeah. I don't, hmm. I'm going to think on that. I'm glad this is on tape. <laughs> You've said so much that I can't wait to listen to. <laughs> I mean, you were against yourself. You were like, I'm not interested to know what's deeper. I'm just pissed. Wow. I mean, the, wow. Like, I know. I see. You were not connected. You were like, you, you, you got rejected as a child. You got separated as a child. So why wouldn't you have learned to keep separating exactly. yourself from yourself? Wow. Yeah. This particular, never, guy, this particular yeah. patient of mine was bullied. And how could he not? So I said, you're bullying yourself. Right. Rose taught me that. <laughs> yeah. It's a punitive super ego, it's called. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you guys. No, but just... it, it makes sense because it is a relationship with yourself. You said that. And right. the symptoms are not physical, they're emotional uh, reflection. Yeah. Look, could we just sort of pause on that for a moment? Because, yeah. as you said, the relationship with yourself, it's almost like you've got a. a, a, a a, a, a chorus, you know, a Greek chorus in your head. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. Greek chorus is going to remind you about what you haven't done. Wow. Isn't that, would that be the right way of putting it? Yeah. You know, yeah. The, that mm. Greek chorus, you know, like in a Greek, in a Greek tragedy, the, yeah. the protagonists do their thing and then the chorus echoes it. And that's okay. exactly what's going oh, wow. on. <laughs> wow. Yeah. When when we yeah. have that punitive, it's like an attitude, isn't it? It's not what like something concrete. What's a punitive? It's an attitude. What does punitive mean, Rose? Punitive. Punish. Punishing. 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 Yeah. Yeah, punishing yeah. ego. Yes. Wow. Yes. Well, I always got punished as a kid. Wow. Yes. So then you punish yourself because right. the pattern set up. I got punished for that. And the other thing that w we will notice is that often. We will berate ourselves because we know we're going to be berated. So we'll do it to ourselves first because right. it's not going to be so bad when someone else tells us off. But in actual exactly. fact, it's a double whammy. You're doing right. it first to yourself. You're punishing yourself. So you're humiliating yourself. You're building up a sense of shame. And then someone yes. says, well, you didn't do that right. And, right. you know, it could be at work. It could be in a relationship it could be whatever yeah. and there's so many different tones of it so it's not just one little particular way there's so many tones within that thing and you know right. you were saying about uh, having the headache at work and i thought how interesting because as you said that i thought i wonder what somebody said to you at work and how you punished yourself for something that was probably normal and you well know, yeah this is, I mean, I have so many thoughts on this. I mean, interesting that my healing began when I could work from home. I love what I do. I love the people I work with. But my office, the triggers are intense. It's very noisy. I mean, like every office, everyone interrupts. And I'm, um, you know, I'm easily freaked out or scared. Yeah. And I hate yeah. being interrupted. 
and they would they make fun of you. You know, it's a very bullying atmosphere. And so being home, I felt safe to do the work. And there's a Yiddish word, uh, mashugana. I don't know who knows mashugana. And I owe it means kooky, right? What does it mean, Tova? I it's don't... like a, like a you know, like like a like a street man, mashugana. Yeah. So I always felt so much. You know, that was a word my mother used to use. And in my office, I felt like I was the wow. quote unquote crazy one, and you know, picked on or. And it, it, it hurt me, duh, no wonder I woke up with a headache once or and twice. the paradox, a Karen, is that you wouldn't treat anybody like that. Exactly. Yes. But you yeah. treat yourself like that. Right. That's, that's the irony, isn't it, really? Yeah. Right. Nobody else should be treated like that. Exactly. I, yeah. Yeah. But I need it. I need to. Because if I don't, I'll fall off the tracks as well. There's right. another yeah. aspect to that. And that yes. is, if I don't punish myself, well, I'll misbehave. Or no, that's not quite right. But well, that's right. how I'll learn. That's how I'll be a better person. I, I, yeah. I, I wanted to be better so badly it hurt. I keep using those words, but I just, you know, and I, I just turned sixty. Well, I'm going to be sixty-one in May, and I feel better now than I did through my forties and fifties. Also, because I'm finally really good with who I am. Yeah. And that's half the, the battle. Audience, you don't have to get to 60 to get that way. Even though exactly. 60s are a great decade, you yes. can figure this out on your own. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. the community, the people that are here, I really think this community is huge. We didn't, I didn't have this 10 years ago, right? It wasn't, all these podcasts weren't around. And every people are using TMS Wiki like all the time. People from Israel are going to TMS Wiki. I'm like, Oh my God, like TMS Wiki. Right. Amazing, amazing support. Amazing I know. people. Yeah. So here's, Look, here's, a, can, here's a question from can we, can we can you, draw on can Karen? You talk uh, about, uh, can you just talk about the fibromyalgia? I'm sorry, Rose. I don't have fibromyalgia. I never had that diagnosis. Oh, I thought you did. Uh oh. Yeah. But fibromyalgia <laughs> is just a name for TMS. So could you talk right. about that for a minute? I know. Oh, Trisha, well, Trisha may not want to believe that, but I'm I'm on the line here on the recording saying TMS is fibromyalgia, and that's psychosomatic symptoms that are reflecting in the body and caused from a psychological reason. So, Trisha, I'm willing to back that up and and talk about that. It's not something. Can what is your experience with that, Karen? About fibromyalgia? I mean, I had a lot of the symptoms of fibromyalgia, but never got that diagnosis. But I had the chills body aches, you know, exhaustion. I mean, I don't really know, you know, but again, all this, I would call Sarno, he'd say something and it would go away till the next one came very soon but after. Then Sarno was the cause of it. Like, what do you mean? Like, what would Sarno, Sarno say? Sarno was the cause of her pain, was she? Like, what would happen? He, he would was, say, go away, what would, what would you do? It, it just was like, a, again, when he said to me about the toe pain, hogwash, put your heels back on. And so for me, this was right around when I started having to commute. I always wore high heels and I was turned 41 and it really bothered me that I couldn't wear high heels. It really did. You know, I thought, what's a sign of aging? I didn't want to look frumpy or matronly. And it really, I remember I used to walk to work four blocks in my high heels and now I'm wearing flats and I'm waddling and my toe hurts. And he said, hogwash, put your heels back on. I cannot believe, telling your brain there's nothing wrong with wearing high heels. I know. Now my toe hurts sometimes now, but I literally, I laugh at it. And yeah, I mean, so his confidence, I think. Mm. Was there a part of compliance with when, when the expert told you what to do? Yes. Oh, yes. I wanted to be a good girl. Yeah. Do so everything the doctors told me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then if you're mad at the doctor because you didn't feel better, that's another relationship that you look at. Well, and so yet it, I had. That's the, that's the um, seesaw, though, compliance and defiance. Right. Yeah. And I, I would had moments of clarity, for instance, being wheeled into the surgery, loopy, knowing in that moment, don't show me those x-rays. I mean, this was 
eight years ago. You know, now from all of you guys, I would know that, but I don't know why I knew that. And when my doctor years ago said he wanted to send me to a neurologist, I knew enough to say no. But yet I would kept taking Excedrin or whatever medicines were, you know. <laughs> so. There's nothing wrong with taking medication. Nothing wrong with taking the pain. Like I just, I don't, I don't go with Sarno directly. And I was talking right. to a physical therapist today. If you're like he, to him, it was black and white. No more physical yeah. therapy, no more chiropractic, no more nothing. Yeah. It's psychological. You can right. calm your pain down with something and then calm your brain down with, with safety, what do you think? Uh, uh, could I yes. challenge you, can disagree. Dr. Tova? Yes. Mm -hmm. What about breathing and meditation? Wouldn't that be better than paracetamol? 100%. 100%. 100%. You, yes. Yeah. Yes. But I don't fight. I used to not take medicine or I'd beat myself up if I did it wrong. And if I took medication, I would beat myself up. Now, I mean, I do meditate every day. I used to be a bit of a self-medicator and a drinker and a pot smoker, but to numb my pain. So mm -hmm. I don't, I never drink if I'm anxious or sad. I'll only have a cocktail, nothing excessive when I'm happy. So now if I do take an Excedrin, I don't beat myself up, but it's interesting. I read something, I think it was on Nicole's Facebook group. A woman did the motion of taking her medicine without taking it and her headache went away. <laughs> That's placebo. I loved that. Yes. Unbelievable. Do you yes. know, you know, I was talking to, I was listening to this, this, uh, James Penny Baker about the expressive writing. He's a scientist, but he said that some people were right, right. in the air. Yes. I listened last night. It's fascinating. It's the, and the brain is, look, you know, th that I learned this also from the Joe, Defen the Joe Dispenza work. If mm. I'm imagining I can be better, if we can imagine I can go dancing, if I can imagine I can walk a block and really, I'm honest with myself. I'm really honest. I really imagine, as opposed to like right. critical or judgment, the 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 uh, the unconscious will begin, the brain will begin to believe, and it will so, be yeah. Well, look, uh, uh, you know, you made me think about people like Marconi yeah. that realized about transmission of of waves and that we could, you know, radio waves. Um, Bell Alexander Bell with the telephone. That's how all these wow. things happen. You know the wheel you know right and, and the axle on the wheel once upon a time the whole axle had to move whereas somebody saw it and thought no we can actually put some um uh, bearing things in the middle so that the axle can stay straight and the wheels can turn right i mean right this is exactly it, what happens in us that we do the same the same action but what we're doing is we're actually um, uh, promising ourselves that it's bad rather than well, and yeah yeah dr uh, dan buglia one of the things and again i have nuggets from all of you guys he would i was a big what if this what if i freak out what if i don't feel when well when i travel because one or two times i'm so scared of the day i travel so what if I feel great the day I travel? Like, hmm, you know, reading magazines, watching a movie I wouldn't see. And, and, and so now, I even before I go to bed at night, I used to have really bad dreams. They were like three theme dreams. And now I talk to myself like I'm going to dream peaceful. Or I picture myself, I love floating in an ocean or swimming. So I literally, why not? I can have a peaceful dream or if I have an icky dream, it doesn't have to freak me out. Excellent. Intention. Yes. Setting intention. Exactly. And that's what I do Excellent. in every, yeah. Rose, yeah. what you're talking I about, think, Rose, is Karen, also, go ahead. Go ahead, Rose. Karen, also, it doesn't always work immediately. Could you share a little bit about that? Because people will say, you know, I did all this, I did all that, but yeah. actually oh. it's only little microscopic Right. insights that you get at first and then it grows and grows and grows exactly but you've got to be patient 
with your microscopic insights. And as and, you've been talking, right. you've actually been expressing that, but I don't know that we've actually fully developed it, that there's all of these things are just... You, right. Tova's got this thing about the gap between... Tell us what it is. The gap between an action and, and a thought. What, oh, oh, Victor Frankl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Between a thought and an action... That's a microsecond. A moment, you have a moment... Yeah to make a decision, it could be a second. And in that decision or in that choice that you have. In that tiny, tiny it's window. Freedom, it's freedom. And that's yeah. what we did in the concentration camps. Rather than, oh, there's food, I'm gonna starve. He took a bite and gave, like, however it happened. And what Rose was saying was that we're so in control, like Viktor Frankl was in control, you know, in the most horrible situation in the world, we are in control in a dramatic situation where we feel like we want to die. We're in control there and we can make a decision that there's a reason for this. Like Victor Frankl's like, there's a reason I'm here and there's a reason for me to live. And so I'm making a choice. And we talked about choice last week with Rita and Tamar making a choice. We have to believe we're we're powerful in a, in a humble way. There's the tuning of ego. In a humble way, I can do this. I can be out of pain. I can, I can, I can, I can. Sure. But it, that decision making is just a microsecond. And if you don't catch it, it doesn't matter. That's you can point. catch it an, another time. And that's what I'm trying to point out. Exactly. Yeah. And, and one thing, yeah. yeah. I learned from Dr. Dan Ratner is he talks about moment to moment. Mm. And so I'll catch my sometimes, not always, obviously. So it's now I will, I envision myself having sweet dreams or, you know, not, you know, being able to ride the bike and it's the, they add up these things. They become my toolbox. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, on, on top of that, if there's things that you're reluctant to do or you're slow to do or you're slow to sort of take on yeah. board about recovery, listen to music. Do yeah. something to lift you. Yep. Yeah. Right. Movement. Yeah. Movement. Yeah. Movement. Yes. Go outside and take a short walk. Right. But nature. Right. It, it, it is, I don't like the word, but it is sort of, it's like distracting. It's like uh, we're not fooling the brain. We're simply... We're simply understanding, that was my crystal. <laughs> We're simply understanding that we are the brain. Like Hanskin will say, you can't control your thoughts, but you can in a way, you can. You can right. control your results. Well, and, and when I would wake up with a headache, I would have the same routine. And part of that was I had to be in bed with my head in my hands. And a couple of months or maybe more than a month ago, years ago, I got up and I did dishes because what Dan Buglio says, do it anyway. And now I'm training my brain that when I get moving and I drink water, it goes away. So it's the, just get up out of bed. So you are the yeah. placebo. You are the medicine. Yeah. And you're, you're actually changing chemicals. So we're not like right. being fairy here. You're changing right. chemicals, oxytocin, pro, whatever. You're making all these connections, these neuro connections. I mean, this is a chemical reaction that we're creating by, uh, I don't like the word positive thinking, but by hope, belief, gratitude, forgiveness. And it's different things that work in different times. Sometimes I'm not going to take the walk, but I'm going to meditate or I'm going to do dishes or I'm going to read a whatever. It's different. And we are the only ones that know what we need in that moment. Yes. Look, could we, could we go back onto the on track a little bit more yeah. and follow up? Could you put up Rita's comment, please? Yeah. Rita was our guest last week. She healed herself from CRPS, which is watched amazing. So go ahead, Rose. Did you want to mention something yeah. about it? She's just brought up the topic of self-betrayal and how we betray ourselves deliberately. Like not deliberately. How would you put it? 
fatalist, a fatalistic sort of attitude. Yeah. Yeah. And could you sort of draw on that when when you had your headaches and you had to have put your hands head in your hands? Right. That's a sort of a fatalistic sort of attitude, isn't it? About yeah, what what you need. I, I, right. I, I think it's worthwhile to actually draw on that a little bit. Actually, Rita, if you're still listening, can you actually add something to that so that um, Karen can sort of dig into it in a way that it came up for you as the as the um, conversation went? Because like our conversation has drifted away from it, but it's an important part. Well, of recovery to so spot self-betrayal. Yeah. So Rita comes back. It's so hard not to feel like a victim. It's so hard right. not to feel sorry for herself. And we've, I was talking to somebody, you know, Rose Rose taught me, we were Damn. talking about, oh, in the presence process class, about crying and tears of pity, self-pity and te tears of compassion. And I, well, I cried over everything all the time. And I don't cry anymore because I, I mean, I cry when it's appropriate, but I cried over everything. I was scared my husband wouldn't love me or I walked and I felt embarrassed of how I walked. And now I feel so much more confident in who I am. So I don't cry over everything, but there's nothing wrong with crying, obviously. When you did cry, it, it, you felt like... I was, I felt exactly. So this is Rita's response. You, she, you abandon yourself. Well, that's all I knew. Yeah. Well, you were abandoned. And, yeah. But you, and, but in that, yeah. in that moment, when you were abandoned, you actually weren't, but your mind right. has gone to the abandonment. And that's the right. interesting thing that in actual fact, you may have had a fuller life because of the mother that you actually did have rather than I felt so unloved. Yeah. No, that's not true. I have two amazing sisters who love me. I knew what they did. I know they do. My father did, but I just felt so unloved. And then interestingly, every man I would date would have one foot in and one foot out. My therapist would say, you're recreating the abandonment. So you brought this up before. I feel so deserving of good health, financial freedom, and love. And that's a new thing for me in these last, since the TMS journey in the last two years. I feel deserving of feeling good. Yes. I really feel deserving of it. Yes. So when, I, yeah. I mean, now you can draw on when it's happened for you yes. rather than the, rather than the emptiness you can see the fullness but that's exactly. been you know that's like a, a polar shift isn't it yeah oh, and, huge. yeah and you know we call that character change when that happens right. the character changes completely and you no longer remember that you that you were uh, um um adopted for example but you remember right. that the adoption has given you all these wonderful yeah um I remember knowing she, I, we, I remember walking up to the judge's office and the big steps and being, I remember that day I was three years old. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah. We, when yeah. you were adopted, you mean? I remember walking up the steps with my father and my sisters. And I remember the day very clearly. How beautiful. Isn't it office. interesting that, you know, like, it's not the trauma, but the experience of the trauma. Your sisters also lost their mother. One sister. Okay, yeah. one sister. So it's interesting that, you know, it's our experience of our trauma that we have to work with. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. Karen, it's so lovely that we've we've traveled this road because it's yes. sort of it's just an ordinary person's journey, an ordinary right. person to healing. And the healing right. is noticing that you don't no longer have an empty space in you that it's filled right. because i feel full yeah because part of that um tms problem is that there's this empty space in us and we yeah. don't know how to fill it and we want to fill it with with reassurance we want to fill it with yeah. security and safety but you know we don't know if the sun's going to rise tomorrow do we right right <laughs> and yeah. yet we want all this security 
Right. <laughs> right. Good point. Profound, Rose. <laughs> It's true. You made it great. And I love your chemistry, you two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, Rose, we're just two old grannies. <laughs> That's right. No, this Come is on. our two-year anniversary. I think around this um, week, March. Wow. I think we started March 18th with Michael Galinsky, our first show. Oh. So thank you for that. We we like reassurance because we're a human being. We have that human oh condition. We have that we have those symptoms called being human. <laughs> Yes, you're adorable and smart and learned and nurturing, really. Wow. Okay, have we got any more? What else? Ah, oh, here, I never lived in. Can you read that one? Yeah, this is Rita. Oh, yeah, this is very good. I never lived in alignment with my own desires, needs, and values. To thine own self be true. True. Wow. That's my motto. Wow. How lovely. And, and yeah. Rose will, you know, like you mentioned this, Karen, before we say goodbye, we'll just bring this up again. You mentioned about like the people will be, well, why would I, why would I think it's my friend to pay? Like, why am I friending it? Like what on deep, deep level, what is going on in a deep level that we have made this pain our friend and it won't go away because we're drawing it to us. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know, but I do. I think I needed it. I don't know what. But I don't. <laughs> uh, you don't need to punish yourself anymore is the idea. Right. Thank you. Yes. yes. Rita, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Rita. So, yes. Karen, this, what would you leave? What would you leave our listeners with? Just that the hope it's possible for us Ooh. all. Um I just, I want everyone to know that, you know, we can all live, you know, feeling good and let the pain talk to you and we have each other. Yeah. And, and also just to add to that, um, there needs to be some joy. You know, oh. if you're in a relationship that isn't, you want to stay in the relationship, you love the person, but you've got no joy, find joy within you. Because it's there. And one thing, yeah, even all my years of, you know, not feeling well, I always have such deep joy. I laugh very easily, always did. So I think back to my life, I did always have joy, and that's huge. Yeah. It's very huge. So that it's might very, have been something important. that kept you, you, that you, kept you me, liked oh yourself. God. You may not have known yourself, but that you liked what you exactly. didn't know. And you were curious about what very. you didn't know. Exactly. Well, that's important. Exactly. That's I, that's a book. And that's why you're yep. probably a great headhunter, helping people find their job. Like the woman who starred in Love Heals, she she was a financial advisor. I'm like, what a perfect combination of people with money. It's it's the same a, a product that right. we need to have a good relationship with. Um, where you, a job could, could make it or break it, the job. Yeah. Even what you experience. And you know, People need to feel safe. You know, all that's the theme for all of us. Right. Mm. Very good. Could I just, Karen, ha have a little plug for um, all the rage? When you saw all the uh, rage, what, what, what? Oh, what uh, grabbed you? Because you, what? you then checked out all the people who were honest. But what, what lifted you to that next level? If you can well, first of all, I had read, I had been a patient of Sarno's 25 years speaking to him, but now there was all these other people. There's a doctor, Scott Brady, from Florida, who I read 20 years ago. I'm surprised I don't see his name more here. But there was such a, a long period of time where there weren't other doctors and healers. So this movie brought everyone out of the woodwork for me. Yes. And you know, oh, I okay. So you had a collection of people that you could refer to. Now, does that mean that those collection of people you saw them as experts? So they, you, what? what I'm just trying to yeah. dig in there a little bit deeper. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I had had a therapist for nine years, but I felt like the combination of them and then all of a sudden dr schubner i never heard of him and dr hanscombe and dr clark Schechter, and Schechter. Schechter, right and all these doctors and therapists 
you know, and, and they also went through their own healing journey. One doctor had IBS and Nicole had backaches. And Nicole so, was told she would never walk or have babies. So all these doctors, uh, uh, Michael Galinsky, I mean, what he went through, I know he's not a doctor, he's a filmmaker, but like he, I owe him everything actually, because he's the one that made me aware of this whole community. I find it ironic, even though I was a patient of Dr. Sarno's for 25 years. Right. And you went to, I love hearing this, you went to two of his classes and there were 50 people in the room. And I remember there was a woman that he brought on from years previous. She had originally met him. She was in a stretcher and she couldn't walk. And she was now the model on his panel to show us how people could heal. He was a brave soul, Sarn. He was a brave, brave. He was in basement his office. And once you were a patient, you were always a patient. I remember spending $500 in 1991 to go to him. And that was a stretch. And yet he was available for the next 25 years for me. <laughs> That's one way. Of, wow. Yeah. 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 Listen, but he sounds like he was a very open, like he might have been gruff. Oh. But he was, he, he could dig in underneath and, and. It's amazing. Very matter of fact. And just everything yeah. everyone says about him is true. Yeah. Anyway, Karen, thank you so much for thank sharing this. So I hope that this little program will actually lift other people's spirits to actually yeah. see they don't have to have the same journey, but the journey right. is there and you've got to roll up your sleeves yes. and do it. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. really. Bless okay. your heart. Bye. Have a great day. Bye, Bye Rose. Bye. Have a wonderful Bye. day. All the best. Okay, we're going to.